it is no secret that if you are around me long enough, you know, um, I think at this point, my one vice, well, I've got two, but my one main vice is coffee. And I have a favorite coffee mug at home that just says coffee because adulting is hard. And I remember that because being an adult is difficult, particularly when we spend any time watching or reading or listening to the news because it seems all we're hearing about today are active shooters and natural disasters and lives being lost in any number of ways, and it's exhausting. As your pastor, I know that we struggle with private tragedies, people who have died untimely death, accidents that leave us with uh, difficult and devastating consequences, people who suffer serious diseases, and we ask why. Why did this have to happen to this person? They were so good and so loving. We question God's goodness, and sometimes we question God's fairness, and at other times we even doubt God's existence. How can an all-good and all-powerful God allow good people to suffer while wicked people prosper? Prosper. I mean, is this really a part of God's overarching plan? We long to explain things only God can know, and we've spent centuries trying to find cause and effect patterns for every good thing that happens and for every bad thing that happens, and yet we still tell stories of terrible tragedies that have happened to good and faithful people, and we want to make sense of things that make no sense. And so we put our words into God's mouth. And we decide that we will explain for God what's happening. So I recently read a sermon that highlighted this. It was a sermon by Dr. William Sloan Coffin. He was the senior pastor of Riverside Church in New York City from 1977 until 1987. And in 1983, his son Alex was driving in a terrible storm. He lost control of his car, careened into the Boston Harbor where he died. The following Sunday, Reverend Coffin mounted the steps to the pulpit and preached about his son's death. He thanked all the people for their messages of condolences, for the food that they brought to their home, for the arms that went around him when words were not enough. But, but he also got angry. He got angry at the well-meaning people who hinted that Alex's death, his son's death, was God's will. That it was somehow part of God's plan. And Reverend Coffin knew that that anger was good for him. He went on to say, quote, do you think it was God's will that Alex never fixed that lousy windshield wiper? Was it God's will that he was probably driving too fast in such a storm? Was it God's will that he had too many that he had a couple of beers too many that night. Do you think it was God's will that there were no street lights along that stretch of road and no guardrail separating the road and Boston Harbor? The one thing that should never be said when someone dies is it is the will of God. Never do we know enough to say that. And then Reverend Coffin went on to say, my own consolation lies in knowing that when the waves closed over that sinking car, God's heart was the first of all of our hearts to break that night. It's hard to know why these things happen. We long to make sense of senseless tragedies, and we search for reasons even when there are none. Because we just don't like the thing that's just right in front of us. Stuff happens. And this isn't a new phenomenon to ask questions in the wake of tragedy. Jesus was confronted with similar questions. Luke records of two terrible tragedies that occurred in Jerusalem in the book Luke wrote, conveniently called the book of Luke. He talks about a tragedy that happened in the temple and another tragedy that took place near the pool of Siloam. Um, Luke wrote this down in what we now call chapter 13, 
and I want to read verses 1 through 9. You can listen or you can follow along on the screens as I read. Luke writes, At that very time there were some, some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? The gardener replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year, until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. So in this first instance, um, they come to tell Jesus that Pilate, who was the governor at the time, killed some Galileans who were offering sacrifices in the temple, and then he did the unheard of. He took the blood of those Galileans and mixed it in with the sacrifices they were offering, pretty much saying this whole place is now unholy. And really what Pilate was doing was giving a warning to the other Jews that, hey, Rome is in charge. Don't you forget it. And then there was the second incident of a tower that fell on some people um, near the Pool of Siloam, and 18 were killed, 18 people who just happened to be there. So how could these things be explained? That's the question Jesus poses. He poses the question that, that he knew everyone else was thinking. Were those Galileans who Pilate killed worse sinners than every other Galilean in the area? Were the people who were killed by the tower next to the pool of Siloam worse than every other person living in Jerusalem? And Jesus answers his own question, no. But I tell you, unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Now before we jump to Jesus' response, I want to linger for a moment with his question. It's the question Jesus assumes everyone is asking. After all, it's one of the most common questions that was asked then. It's the most common question that's asked now. Are the bad things that happen to us our own fault? Do we deserve them? Are the bad things that happen to us punishment for our sin? And so what's the answer? Well, for the price of one, I'm going to give you three answers. It's a deal today. I think there's three answers that are woven throughout this passage that Luke writes down. First, we're reminded that suffering is not a form of punishment. If there's anything that we can learn from Jesus' sharp retort to the audience, remember what he said, are these Galileans who Pilate killed worse sinners than every other Galilean that's around here? He's saying no. They're no different than everybody else. Suffering and calamity are not God's punishment for sin is the underlying tone of Jesus' response. And just to make sure that the crowd gets that point, Jesus offers that second example of the people who were killed when the tower fell near the pool of Siloam. And he says, were they worse offenders than every other person living in Jerusalem? No, they just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, Jesus said. Second, he reminds us that just because suffering is not punishment doesn't mean it's entirely disconnected from sin. So what happens to us is not a punishment for sin, but can be a result of sin. For example, Pilate's murderous act of terror, killing those Galileans, just like every act of terror committed by a tyrant that we read about in the news today is sinful. Sin has consequences. Unfortunately, there are consequences for all kinds of bad be behavior that contributes to the suffering that's going on in this world. So if we would just stand up a little more and confront injustice in this world, I believe there'd be less suffering. All which brings us to a third and very important thing we can say about this passage. 
God neither causes nor delights in suffering and calamity. That's where the parable of the fig tree comes in. And I want to offer a little bit different take on this parable than, than Sherry offered. Both are valid, but a little bit different. Because when I look at the Gospel of Luke and his consistent reaction or, or his picture of God's reaction to sin, I think the landowner is really representative of us. We're the landowner. And it's our own sense of how we think the world should work. If it's not producing fruit, cut it down. You see, we want things to be fair, and we then define fair as rewards that, you're get, that you get when you do good things and punishment you get when you do bad things, except when it comes to our own mistakes and misdeeds. Then we don't want fairness. We want mercy. So perhaps the gardener is God who consistently raises a contrary voice to suggest that the ultimate answer to sin isn't punishment, rather it's mercy, reconciliation, and new life. And that brings us to God's plan. God's plan is not the stuff we endure. God's plan is not the things that happen to us. God's plan is ultimately a relationship. God's plan is being in relationship with God and being in relationship with one another. Plain and simple, that's it. Jesus, when asked, what's the greatest commandment? Love God with your whole being. Love your neighbor as yourself. Relationship. And we should also remember that this whole discussion that's going on in the Gospel of Luke is taking place while Jesus is walking to Jerusalem, walking steadfastly closer to the cross. And in light of this passage, in light of the whole Gospel of Luke that we're reading together, we should remember that the cross isn't about punishment for sin, not Jesus' sin, not our own sin. The cross is about identification and solidarity and love. God's answer to sin isn't punishment. God's answer to sin is love. In Jesus, God loves us enough to take on our lot and our lives fully, identifying with us completely. In the cross, we see just how far God is willing to go to be in relationship with us and for us, even to the point of suffering unjustly and dying the death of a criminal. And in the resurrection, we see that God's solidarity and love is stronger than anything, even death. And God's example should then teach us we are called to enter into the pain of each other. And in doing so, we become more human. God entered into our pain, we enter into each other's pain. This is precisely the message of Lent. Jesus' humanity led him to be vulnerable, vulnerable to disease, vulnerable to, to every weakness, vulnerable to every injury, vulnerable to every danger. And he never tried to be different from us, never above the threat, never distant from misfortune. And when we bring close the pain of others, we become more human. We're all vulnerable to danger. Recognizing this brings us to empathy, the ability to understand or at least imagine what another might be experiencing. So what is God's plan in the face of suffering and loss? That God is with us. That God understands what our suffering is like. That God has promised to redeem all things, including our suffering. That suffering and injustice don't have the last word in this world or in our lives. And that God will keep waiting for us and urging us to turn away from our self-destructive habits and to be drawn again into the embrace of a loving God. Let us pray.